recognize is that we even ignore the, the, the rape stats. The fact that white women used to rape black men. And then when they were caught out, they would say, no, the black man raped me, and then he'd be executed and hanged. Because they were curious, because they heard that black men have bigger penises. This is The Hustler's Corner. Hustlers and squatters, brothers and sisters from all over the world, big homie DJ Spoo straight out of Johannesburg in South Africa. Tina Sibonga, ooh. Tee, oh. Cold drinking tanda is a lie. <laughs> Guys, first up, go to the description. You'll see a lot of links there. The first link you're going to see is our Learn Crypto link. Learn Crypto link is a collaboration that we've decided to come together with Great Jabesi. Go check out his YouTube platform. It's called Crypto Hustle. He is the founder of Crypto University South Africa. That is www.cryptouniversity.co.za. We've collaborated to come with a Learn Crypto program where we are affording young people or anybody that wants to learn crypto for free, affording them an opportunity to learn for free. Some of you guys who've been in the space for a while, you know how expensive it is to learn these courses. And you guys do know how difficult it may be sometimes to find repeatable platforms to learn from. So we've decided to come up with a platform where somebody pays for it, who's a sponsor, so that the audiences can learn for free. The link is in the description. Click there, go register, become a part of the family. And I'd like to give a big shout out to the sponsors who made sure that you guys don't pay because they're paying for it. That is um, Yellow Card. Yellow Card is a gateway for all the crypto beginners who would like to purchase your crypto. You'd like to be a brand new Bitcoin investor. You can download Yellow Card, link it to your local bank account, and then you can start getting into the cryptocurrency world. Once again, I'm not a financial advisor. Let me just stress that. And let me mention as well that thank you to all the people, young people that have been coming to Amped Studios. We have been doing a cryptocurrency um, physical, you know, physical recordings and physical classes where people come there in town at the Newtown Junction, but we've also been doing some webinars. So just, just click that link, subscribe, and just become a part of the family. We've been doing some great things with KHRBC, with Yellow Card, with M Studios, Leadership 2020, and Crypto University South Africa. That is cryptouniversity.co.za. There's some links there that take you to Ekasi Noble Property Development. For those that are interested in getting into property and real estate, some links there that take you to my YouTube channel, subscribe. I also share some content there. Some links there that take you to Penuel's um, YouTube channel. And Penuel has just started his own brand new YouTube show called The Penuel Show. Go subscribe. He's, he's dropping some dope content over there as well. We've got a brand new podcast called Virtual Mkuku. Also click that and subscribe and become a part of the family. See, there's so many things now to advertise. As the podcast keeps growing, there's a lot of things for us to share and teach. But the most important one, we do know you guys have been asking us about the African New Year happening on the 23rd of September. We're going to have an entire trip starting from the 21st of September. We're coming back on the 25th, being a Sunday. We're going to Inzalo Yelanga, that is Mpumalanga, Adam's calendar. Um, it's always been a dream of our, the late, great Ukoko Credo Muto for our young people, especially in Africa and South Africa, to learn about our African history and African New Year. It's happening on, we're leaving on the 21st of, of September, Manj, 21st. Mm. And then we're driving to Mpumalanga, convoy. There is some activities that we've organized outside. There's a gala dinner. And we've invited just a lot of people who are in this spiritual place to come and teach us and share with us knowledge as we learn. And mm. so there's by the mountain there. It's just going to be an, an, mm. an interesting experience, you know? Oh, that's dope, that's dope. So now I'm going to tune There's a link there as well that takes you to the packages. So you can buy the package. We've got gold packages, we've got platinum packages, and we've got diamond packages. He's back here. Some people always ask, like, why do you always have Nota coming back over and over? It's because the relationship is not just about the podcast. And I'm sure some of you guys who watch podcasts from all over the world, you will see that there's a lot of podcasts that have got regular visitors. If you watch Vlad TV, before Charlemagne became Charlemagne, he used to be a regular visitor on Vlad TV's podcast. <laughs> like right now, no, Boosie Bu Badass. Yeah, Boosie. Boosie is funny. <laughs> 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 Young Lachisu Boosie. <laughs> Speaks his mind, bro. He's always on Vlad TV's podcast as and he was well. banned everywhere else. At, at, at some point in time, he was banned on Facebook. And yeah. So at some point, um, Vlad was the only place where you could see Boosie. <laughs> yeah. You know? So yeah. When I think of the name Boosie, Boosie. <laughs> And that's what it is even in the country. You, you've got... You, you know, Pussy out just a cast, just a state. Yes. Like, like, yeah, that is, like we understand him. Yeah, no, that's why I we, get we it. Don't, yeah, we don't yeah. always agree with him. It's like, ish, but no, we understand. Yeah, <laughs> we, understand yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we understand where he's coming from. It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
So Nota is back because I've heard some things over the past couple of weeks and me being a bigger brother in the industry from, from time to time, mm. I would like for people to just sit down and let's have a chat, you know, and, and I'm concerned. I'm concerned about your well-being. Mm. Uh, I have heard, I have not called to ask you about those. I've mm. called just to have a brother-to-brother conversation about other matters. Mm. But I am concerned about you. I'm concerned about your health. I've heard rumors which you, you know, you've just separated with your wife and all of these different things that I'm hearing. Mm. I'm not interested in the gossip mm. and I'm not interested in the detail. For me, I'm just going to check out Ukraine now, mentally, um, psychology, psychologically, and just health-wise. Ukraine now. So this podcast today has no agenda. And mm. there is no topic. It's just us catching up and chopping it up. It's September, man. It's starting to become warm. We last spoke in winter, you know. Dan, Ukraine, the nota. Are you okay in Tamula Baloy? I'm concerned uh, about you. Yeah, no, man. I've been good. Um, like you know, the whole time. So it's just weird. For um, obviously, when things come out into the public, people then assume that you, you as a person, haven't dealt with it prior. We haven't, we haven't recorded an episode with my wife being home in my place. You know what I mean? So uh, that whole entire thing ha- happened prior to every single episode we've done. So every Are you serious? Episode, yeah. Oh, oh, so that's old stuff. So it's things that you've had to deal you with. Know, so I've, so I've you're dealing with, with them it. quietly, privately. Yeah, I've dealt okay. with it quietly, privately. Um, it's just unfortunate um, that now, you know, I've had to deal with it publicly um, because of, uh, you know, a lot of um, the things that have been said about me that are very unfair and unfortunate, you know, um, and especially coming from my wife in particular, you know, um, it's really the most hurtful thing um, because, you know, the whole world can hate you or the whole world can turn against you. But once your own wife then turns and starts echoing what the world is saying about you, um, you know, it really, uh, it really hurts. Like the betrayal is, that's the worst thing. It's, it's the worst pain that one can ever go through. Um, so I've been going through it. I, I went through it even prior to, um, her leaving. And in fact, it was the reason for, um, her leaving. I, I just said to myself, you know, um, I've put up with enough betrayal you know, within my own household, within my own marriage, where, you know, I've done each and every single thing that is expected of a good husband to be. Um, I've been what the proverbial perfect husband um, and more. Um, But I'm also a human being. And there were things that were happening to me, things that were happening in my life that were affecting me negatively. And I was expected to still be a provider, a protector and perform as if nothing has gone on. Um, a business I dedicated a lot of my young life to collapsed in front of my wife's eyes. She watched it happen. You know, um, COVID came. Everybody lost. We both lost. I lost my income as well. She lost her income. But, you know, I made sure that um, she was never short of anything. Um, I took that on the chin, um, you know, and she never struggled. I made sure that everything that she needs for her career to continue um, happens even if she wasn't making an income. I made sure that I will take the knock. Um, uh, I lost a very close, very close uh, friend of mine who I'd worked with also for a long time, Perko. And um, when he died, you know, I remember there was a, a point in time where I was sitting on my balcony, um, sitting on the balcony, like holding on to uh, uh, my knees and crying. Because I just wanted to cry, you know, um, because within my own home, I felt like I can't even show emotion anymore. Um, I, I, can't, I can't be weak. I, I can't, uh, I can't um, be vulnerable. I can't tell my wife I'm going through something because she's going to use it against me or she's going to bring it up at an inconvenient time to make me seem as if I'm weak. Um, unfairly so. And, um, and that really hurts me. You know, I, I put up with it for such a long time to the point where I was like, you know what, um, fine. If, if you want us to uh, take some time to separate, like actually let us do it. And 
for the record, I want you to know that for this whole entire time, I've been repressing a lot of my feelings and my, a lot of my disappointment simply because I understand that as a black woman, it's very difficult for you to love a black man because the world has been so unloving to black people in general. And therefore, black women don't get taught how to love at all from society. And um, black men as well don't get taught how to receive love at all from society in general. I just so happen to be one of those fortunate few who has been in a family environment where I know how to receive love. I know how to give love. I know what love is, you know. And, um, and I, I was done putting up with not being loved, you know, because when you love someone, you accept things about them that you don't like. Because that's what love is. It's about accepting things that, you know, I might not like something about you, but I love you, you know, because I'm a human being and I also know that there's certain things about me that you might not like. But because you love me, we're able to delude each other. You know, it's, a, it's about delusion. Self-delusion is what teaches us to love ourselves. When you look in the mirror, sometimes you're looking a little bit overweight, but you need to delude yourself saying, I need to be confident when I go out into this world. You know what I mean? I need to tell myself I'm sexy. So the, the, the love, I wasn't getting love. Were, love you, were you giving love though? So much, you know, um, so much. And um, to the point where, you know, it was like a pattern for me because the, the, the beginning of my relationship, the way it started was not because I was romantically interested in my wife. You know, I was just helping someone who wanted assistance, but she availed herself to the point where I could see, okay, maybe she might be interested. And then I thought to myself, okay, well, at least she understands how it is to be in the public eye. So it's convenient. So, you know, I could let my guard down um, because people in our position, you'd know this yourself personally, you're always thinking to yourself, a woman can use you as a come up. So you, you want to eliminate any woman that could use you as a stepping stone um, or could have more to gain from being in a relationship with you. So from that perspective, you know, her having her own brand, being, you know, a public um, 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 a figure in her own right, you know, I thought, okay, there's less risk of her um, coming with the wrong intentions. And um, she herself said to me, she's seen me love everybody else. She's seen me take care of everybody. And she's never seen anybody take care of me. She wants to be there to take care of me. And that was the reason for our relationship. When she said that to me, I thought, wow, this is the first time someone has said to me that they want to take care of me. Um, and even with her taking care of me or attempting to take care of me, I was still taking care of everybody else. I was taking care of her. I was still taking care of um, uh, 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 what you call? I was still the team. The team, everybody, Every, even the team. After rap life collapsed, I was still taking care. When Marco was having a baby, I was making sure that he's got money for the delivery of his baby. I was making sure that um, Kidex everything he needs at his time of need, he's got it. I was making sure that everything that Questa needs, he's got it. You know, it doesn't matter what they were saying about me negatively in the press in the public. I made sure that they were all provided for. I was taking care of everybody. Every, there's no one around me that you saw suffering. You didn't, it didn't look like my wife's career was suffering. In the middle of COVID, she was shooting videos, she was doing tours, she was doing everything, you know. So to the best of my ability, the way I knew how, I was supporting her. I was not getting the same support. And it got to a point where I, like, I'm tired of not getting the support that I need, you know. Um, I'm tired of, I'm tired of, of being beaten up by the police and my wife believing that I deserve to be beaten up by the police because I'm a black man and black men deserve to be beaten up by the police. You know, I was tired of the hypocrisy of my wife saying, oh, you always stand up to police. But then at the same time, when police stop her and are being unfair to her, she'll call me and then I'll talk to the cops on the phone and then they won't bother her and then she'll be able to be let free. So it's as if. She was saying to me without seeing it that I deserve to be abused 
because I'm a black man, I should be able to take it. She's a woman and therefore she's a victim. She's a perpetual minor. She needs to be protected and taken care of. But if I'm supposed to be the one that you are taking care of, how are you taking care of me when I'm being abused, physically abused? And you are further emotionally abusing me and telling me that, no, I deserve it. You're gaslighting me. How am I supposed to accept that? How am I supposed to take that? How am I supposed to go out there into the world and be a confident man, knowing that every single time I go home, the same person that I'm fighting the entire world to make sure that I provide and I am able to protect her is my own enemy as well, is fighting me, is stopping me from being able to protect her, is stopping me from being able to provide for her because the world is telling her that she needs to dominate me so that she can keep me as a slave that always works to her benefit, how she wants, instead of being a partner who always works to uplift her and support her. Because the mistrust that the black women have for black men, right, is fed to them in every single piece of media that you see. The mistrust is fed to them. When you see a billboard that says stop gender-based violence, what it means is that black, people are, uh, black men are beating up women. When you see, as they say, stop xenophobia, it means black men are, are killing um, other black foreigners. Every single thing that is about man, man, men behaving badly is about black men. Because what has happened to the black man is that the black man has been dehumanized. He's been dehumanized to the point where he can be raped. It does not matter that a black man gets raped. Because Jube Jube will go onto McGee's podcast and talk about all the things he had to do to avoid himself getting raped and all the rampant rape that happens inside prisons where black men are getting raped. Black men are getting raped more than women get raped in this country. But it's not an outrage that black men get raped because we believe that black men deserve to get raped. If Jube Jube came out and went to McJ and said he got raped in prison, people would have said, yes, you deserve it. That's what we think of the black man. So how am I to think that if the police are unfairly beating me up and I'm saying to my wife, please get this on camera, record evidence so we can use this in court, she's not going to think to herself, no, you are being beaten up by cops, you're a black man, this is how black men are, you get beaten up by the cops and then you die and then we'll celebrate you when you're dead and say, um, rest in peace, George Floyd, black lives matter. Because that's the only time black men are valuable is when they're dead. But have you tried to reconcile recently? You're saying it's been a couple of months now. Are um, you guys at least keeping the friendship alive or, or things nah, like that? There's, no, there's no way... Irreconcilable. Irreconcilable. No, there's, there's no way we can, we can have a conversation until she sees me as a human being. You see, so for me, I've got certain standards. I'm saying I'm not willing to reduce myself to less than a human being. I need you to accept responsibility for abusing me. I need to accept that you have abused me in certain ways, whether it be financially abusing me by ensuring that I only use my finances on things that benefit you and anything that you don't agree with, I cannot use my finances for because those are my finances. You know, that is a form of financial abuse. And when women speak about this and say they are fi being financially abused in their relationships because the husband wants to control the wife's salary and everything else, you know, we are horrified. But men never speak about the fact that your wife now is the one who decides what you do with your income. And if you're the breadwinner in the household, how is someone who is not able to provide for the entire household income now being the person who says, no, I'm the woman, and because I'm a woman, I now need to control the finances? We wouldn't have finances if it was up to you. But isn't it why people are always encouraged to go for pre marital counseling before even engaging in the, mm. in the union of marriage to discuss such things? Uh, these, are, these are the things that you, we, we need to discuss. These are the things that uh, are supposed to happen. How We can't go for counseling if both parties are not willing to go for counseling. I've spoken a lot about how I've gone for counseling for my entire life. Since I was four years old, I've told you this, that I've, I'm not a stranger to therapists. I'm not a stranger to psychologists. I go to therapy all the time. I told you even that I put my whole entire family through therapy. These are part of the reasons why I put my family through therapy, you know, and we're still undergoing that therapy even now to this day, you know, and when was this that we had that conversation? Around February, March. Yeah. Right? So, around March. So, that level of women being entitled, right, to a certain level of 
financial control over men's purses because they are women, merely because they're women, not because they're the ones who provide the income in the household, but because the media is now telling black women in particular that black men are so not to be trusted. If you don't control his wallet, he's going to spend all his money at Gonka. So now you need to control his wallet. You need to make sure that you are watching each and every single cent he spends. He, you can't trust him to be a good man. And I'm saying to myself, I'm, I don't go out to the nightclub. I'm not anywhere. Why am I not able to express myself? Why am I not able to have my own financial purchases? And why is it that when I speak about this, my wife then decides she's going to start crying so that we can't have this difficult conversation? So now, on top of the financial abuse that I'm getting, I'm getting emotionally abused. You know? And that was so difficult because a lot of people think abuse is like a physical thing. She'd need to slap me or something like that. No, it's abuse is like now I can't express myself because someone is crying and using the fact that they can cry to silence me. Now I can't criticize them. You know, it would be something as simple. Financial abuse it would be as simple as I've got a savings card that um, is like a Capitec credit card, um, a savings card that I let my wife use so that she can, it's like, you know, the wife card, basically. And there's money in the savings account. And then the, the credit account is supposed to be on a positive balance. It's supposed to stay flat, right? And when you tap that card, it'll go automatically to the credit card. And I would tell my wife, this is a card I give you to use all the time. I can't tell you each and every single time you use it that please don't tap the card. Make sure you insert it so you can choose the savings option because you're taking the credit balance lower. And it affects me. And, you know, we'd argue about this over... Well, we wouldn't argue about it because I couldn't argue anything. So I'd, I'd raise this on many occasions. And I'd be saying, you know, it's so hurtful to me that this thing is this very small thing. But the fact that you ignore it each and every single time means that even if I bring up something small, you, 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 you so don't care about my feelings that you're, you're just completely disregarding this. And then your answer to it, oh, I take your card. And I think to myself, how is that an answer to use me saying, listen, there's money here for you to be able to use it every single time you want to use it, right? Please make sure that you use the right account. It's just a simple request. You know what I mean? If it was a PIN code, I wouldn't have to remind you each and every single time you use the card what the PIN code is. So why is it so difficult for me to remind you? Why is it so difficult for you to just remind yourself to insert the card? and use it with um, um, caution and care. So that was another form of financial abuse that I never knew until I had time by myself. You know what I mean? Since I was apart to actually look, through, what have I actually been going through? What is it that has been actually been done to me? Because I could tell that, you know what, I've undergone something. I'm not myself. You know, I've undergone a process to basically dehumanize me, make me feel like I deserve less than what any normal human being should be granted in respect, in you know, fair treatment, um, in courtesy, um, and all those things. So, and, and, and I don't know where it's coming from because I haven't put my wife in a, in, in a position where she would need to put me through that. I have not, I'm not a person who's been so reckless with their money that they're in debt, they don't know how to pay bills or stuff like that, you know what I mean? And I'm in a better financial position than she is. So there's no rational reason why she would think that she could advise me financially you know what i mean because if, uh, person it personally you know she was financially dependent on me you know so i had to look back and think what are the outside influences that could be now entitling her to this treatment of me to feel like no she needs to treat me like this and it's our media I guess that's why a lot of elders always encourage, as I'm going to say it again, pre-marriage counseling. Because apparently in those talks, you discuss everything. You lay it on the table before you even get into the commitment itself. I don't think I'm the right person to even discuss further with this topic because I, I'm not a married man. I've never been married. But also, somebody else might be watching but Where did this. you learn about marriage? Um, from my parents. No, no, no. Just watching my parents. No, no, no. That's the one marriage you've seen. Yeah. How many marriages have you seen in your life? Uh, I think others, but from Not a distance. Not personally. From a distance. How many marriages have you seen in your life? How many weddings have you seen? A lot. 
I've attended How many a lot adverts of have you seen where a people lot, are getting married? A lot. How many um, magazine covers have you seen where people are getting married? A lot. But let, let me drive to the point here before I forget it. Because mm. I know when Nota takes the mic, it doesn't stop. Mm. And I don't like stopping Nota because you're driving to a certain point. I wanted to say, somebody else can say no, but Nota is not taking accountability. Has he also looked at the mirror and, and said, maybe I'm sounding like I'm blaming my wife and I'm shifting the blame to some of the things that have happened towards my wife. Maybe let me also look at some of the things I might have done to take responsibility. Not that I want an answer there. I also don't want to dwell too much on your marriage. Mm. That's not the, the reason for this chat today. What I want to know is, are you, are you healing though? Are you okay? And, and yeah. do you miss her? Yeah, no, obviously, I, I, obviously I, I miss my wife very much. But, you know, she needs to go through a process um, where she learns to love herself to the point where she can then give love. Because this industry doesn't teach you that. You can become a, a superstar, you can become a singer that people know, right? But that doesn't mean that peop you love yourself, you know? And you know, you can tell if someone loves themselves based on how they treat other people. If, if you've ever been in the car with me, right? If you've ever been in the car with me, everywhere I go, there's not a, a gate I don't go into where the security guards don't have a conversation with me. There's not a restaurant I frequent where the waiters, they don't come by five to the table to come catch me up on the latest story, the latest gossip, what's happened, and everything else. You know, if you, if you see me having coffee outside the garage, you'll see me having conversations with the petrol attendants, them telling me about the latest soccer games, which players are, are useless, whatever, you know what I mean? Why? Because I don't see myself as someone who is above people. That is the treatment that I give people. And that is something that I, I try to teach that to my wife. The way in which my wife came into this country, right? It was all about having to protect a certain status. And if you, if you, have, if you, you, if you have to have a certain status to have the benefit of being treated like a citizen, like a resident or whatever, it means that now you need to classify people. And that's what racism is. Racism doesn't only have happen between black and white or people of different colors. Because, you know, unlike, um, I saw you guys speaking with, uh, uh, what's her name? Ooh, this is Naled Mashir. She was, saying we've oh, got three, machine, Monday, yeah. she was saying we've got three races. No, we don't have three races. We've got one race, the human race. It was released in medical reports in April this year that the human genome has been sequenced. It's, we've got one race. The difference in our skin color is based on our exposure to the sun. That is it. That's what I've been saying. So the difference in our classes, right, is based on certain things like tribalism, you know, um, uh, uh, our economic standing, you know, um, uh, a whole lot of different things. Certain classes of people, racism, the concept of racism, it's got nothing to do with what color you are. Certain ra racism is about classifying which people are human and which are not. Jews less than human. So what do we do to the Jews? We say they're thieves. They're, they, 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 they rape women. Um, uh, 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 they're corrupt. They're going to take your money. They're going to be the only ones that get rich. And then what does that do? It turns everyone against the Jewish people. Then we say, oh, Yes, uh, black men, oh, they're savages, they're uncivilized, they live in the bushes, they rape their women, they beat their women, all of those things. And then what does that do? It makes the black people less than human. But the common thread is that the way in which we now classify people as subhuman is that we attack the male 
So we attack the Jewish man, we reduce him to a point where he's less than human, and therefore we can exterminate 75% of Jews in Europe. We can kill them because we've reduced them to something that is less than human. That it, we've seen it happen. It happened in the world. That was World War II. It's what's created the current world order. What's happening with black men, we can enslave them. We can keep them in our houses, right? We can trap them. And then what do we do? Once we create them as a danger, we then make their own wives think of them as a danger. So we gather up all the black women that we want to be working inside our houses, and then we say, let's march against past laws. 1956, against the Group Areas Act. So we, now we convince the black woman that she is not a savage like the black man. She's not a rapist like the black man. So she can work inside our houses. Let's keep the black man out. So now what does that do to the black woman when she has a son? The son can come to the master's house up until a certain age. When he reaches the point where he becomes a little tzotzi, he's not allowed to come anymore. The daughter is now allowed to come. So now we've created a whole entire generation of black men who, at a certain age, they become a threat to society, the white society, the pureness of the white society. And then we need to cut them out. So we've been trained. So in as much as people are saying, have you not looked at yourself and done some introspection and seen where your faults are? I'm saying, have you not looked at yourselves and done some introspection and seen where your faults are? To not see when I'm saying I'm being abused. To not see when I'm saying the cops beat me up. They arrested me having committed no crime. I had to take off my own pants, act like a madman behind those cells to get myself, up, to get myself out. You guys laugh at that. It's entertainment for you. You put it up on TikTok, and then you send it to your family members. You share it in stories. That's my trauma. That's something I've gone through. And then you still want to then ask me, are you okay? Are you fine? And I just told you about the trauma that I just went through. I went, walked up to Stogie T. I confronted him to have a man-on-man -man conversation. He decided to become a savage, an animal, and try and attack me physically. It didn't turn out good for him. I did not get beaten up or anything else. But merely because I did not get beaten up or anything else, I need to have no empathy in that situation. When I went there to him to actually have a proper conversation where we could build, and he decided to destroy. And then he decided to have an apology for everybody else but me. The last conversation that I had with you were with Peño, apart mm. from the one that we had uh, man to man, um, mm. just you and I, was such a beautiful conversation because a lot of people always say when you are on the Hustler's Corner and Virtual Kuko, it's like you guys bring out... Another side of Nota that I don't know if a, a lot of people are actually aware. Of, well, a lot of them are now how intelligent you are mm. and how amazing you are. But in, the, in that last interview, I loved how you were talking about um, upgrading. You want to become more presidential. You don't want to be dragged all the way down there in the mud with people who are trying to beef with you online. Mm. You're going to be moving differently. And I was so excited and I was so happy when that interview happened. Mm. And I'm not saying that's not how you're moving right mm. now. And that's the nota that I want to see. That's mm. the nota that I like. Every time when you come, guys, go check out all the episodes when we've had nota on this podcast. Just the level of intellect and the discussions, you get to understand how much of an incredible mind he is. And that's the nota that I want to see. I know it's a mm. journey. It's not something that, so you know, that, that, you just change your life in a month. But that's, uh, that's, that's the, the nota that I, that's how I want you to move. That's the nota that you, my enemies don't want you to see. So... I told you when I took that decision that I'm not going to be punching down and striking back at people who are not on the level. If I punch, I punch up, if ever I punch. And that's why I, I have been punching up, because it is a fight at the end of the day. As, as, as black men, right, we need to go through struggles. You don't become Nelson Mandela unless you spend 27 years in prison. As a black man, you need to suffer. That's unfortunately the world that we've uh, 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 um, uh, uh, designed, well, that has been designed for us by elite white men who control the world, you know? And the only counter to, to their power are the Chinese, you know? 
elite white men from the West and, 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 and from Russia have been battling for control over the world, you know, um, since the, the First World War. It's been a battle. I understand that, Nita, and, and, but I don't want to be, see you fighting Nabo, Nabo Stogiti. We are all the same no, no, family. No. I don't want to be seeing you that's the thing. Um, touring with people on, on Twitter and no, in the Tugana. That's fine. I, that's not the nota I want to see. No, the, the, the thing is this. Because I know what you're capable no, of in here, that's, bro. That's exactly what we do to the black man. We destroy him. Exa- you see what you just did? That's exactly the destruction that we have to the black man. Because you don't see what my point is. You don't say, what is Nota's stance is? Is Nota wrong in this engagement? Let us actually be fair judges of this engagement. Why can't we call out, Stogie T is the one who's wrong. He's wrong. He's 40-something years old. He's older. He's an elder statesman. And instead of leading the youth in the right direction, he's leading them in the wrong direction just so that he can be celebrated and get clout right now in this generation because it's cut successfully. And that's the thing. He's holding on to the glory days that he was robbed of in the past. And he's trying to have those in, in today's time. And that's not the conversation that we need to be having. That's not the co- platform that he needs to be uh, holding. And we need to be able to hold ourselves accountable. And when we hold each other accountable, right, we c- cannot now use the fact that, oh, I'm Stogie T, I've got a fan base. Let me try and use my fan base or p- the fact that I'm a popular figure, I've, I've been famous for so many times, to try and destroy Nota and the point, the truth that he's actually speaking. Because I can do that. Because I want to make sure that people clown him instead of actually hearing the truth. Because this is something about building our industry, our nation, our people. So in, in, in everything that is being said, it's that point in time where, where, you, you, where they called you the knickknacks man. Where, you know, it's that phase. <laughs> you remember I'm that. Going, I, I'm, I'm, You've I'm been going in the game. You remember that. Yeah, so that. <laughs> I'm going through that phase where they try and clown you now. That's the phase. They see, okay, fine. This person is highly intellectual, highly influential, very intelligent. The only way we can destroy him is to make him look crazy. So let's even tell his wife, your husband is crazy. The last, the last conversation that I had with my wife happened after she did a gig um, at Stain City at some house and Somizi was there. And at that point in time, I'd already told her, like, you know what, for me, I've got a stance against Somizi. She was invited to do some TV show two days before that. She said, no, Somizi wants you to come do this TV show. I love you, Davi. She said, hey, my husband, we've already spoken about this. No, let's not do it. And they used um, Undombi, um, um, yeah, Shalem Shopper's daughter, to, to call her. She said, I, no, I'm not going to do it. Then they surprised her with this gig. So that gig happened on the 10th of January. When she came back and told me that, no, I saw Somiz at the gig, I was like, okay, I'm about to see serious problems. Because clearly this person has been trying to get at my wife for some reason to either tell her some message or get something into her head to poison her image of me because he knows where my stance is on just things that, you know, he's been getting away with. We have the conversation. She says to me, you didn't tell me that this person is someone that, you know, um, I was surprised that this person, um, the person who booked her, right, for this gig is someone that at a certain point in time, they assaulted me, you know? And I didn't tell her this, but I told her afterwards. And she's like, why didn't you tell me this prior? They assaulted you? Yeah. Okay. Like, held me up, it choked me up against my neck, up against the walls, you know, at a hotel in Belitos some time in the past, you know? And um, I said, well, it's, it wasn't your business. And for me, it's like, I don't want to decide. I don't want to close you out of opportunities. You know, I've never, I've never told my wife, okay, don't do this or don't do that. She's always had her own choice. She's never been locked out of any opportunity um, because of me. Never. If someone's got beef with me and then says, no, I don't want um, uh, 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 to book your wife in the... Well, I mean... She's my wife, obviously. I wouldn't have beef with someone for no reason. You know what I mean? They're so She wouldn't want to be there in the first place. So it wouldn't be a problem. So from that moment onwards, I knew that, okay, whatever is going on here is bigger than me, it's bigger than us. It's obviously, there's a spiritual warfare that they're waging against me, whatever they're trying to do, you know? Uh, my mother gets a call 
to say, yo, there's someone who's trying to kill me or whatever. I'm going to die on my birthday. Kill you? Yes. These are the things that are being told to my wife. All these types of things. That you, you understand what I'm saying? Like, these are the types of things that they're trying to do to poison the people around me. They need to pay 45,000 rands or whatever. My parents end up going to Samsung or my paying 45,000 rands. All these types of things. I, my wife comes back. She sneaks out because they've told her not to see me. She sneaks out. I can tell that I am. Why is she not free? She's with me now. We, we've got an opportunity to talk. She says, no, you know what? Um, I don't know, man. We can't be in the same room together. I'm like, how? We can't be in the same room. Like, what is going on? You know, we haven't had an opportunity to chat. We had an argument and we said, let's give each other space. But that space has been two and a half months of no communication, which, number one, is not right. You know, you don't do that to your husband. You know, I don't care what you're angry at me about. You don't not talk to me for two months. You don't make me have to speak to your father, you know, who you haven't seen in three years or four years. You know what I mean? Um, and I'm the person that you actually live with. So I'm like, okay, fine. Let me try and figure out what's going on. When I go through um, her, her, her phone while she's with me, I realize that, number one, it's actually my old phone. The name of the phone has been changed. And when the name of the phone is changed, it's, it says Berita's iPhone. Her name is not Berita. Berita is her mother's name. Berita is her stage name. So I know that she would never name her own phone. Her name is Gugulet. She would never name her own phone via stage name. You understand? So now I know, okay, there's an outside influence here. I don't know who it is. I can't identify who exactly is the outside influence. But from there, I can tell that someone who's got access to her things, the only person who's got access to her social media and all those things, I'm a password worker, is her stylist. And that's the only person that she was with when she came um, back to South Africa after um, um, she was at her, her grandmother's um, while taking a break for the longest time. So now I see this. Now... I see, okay, fine. She's just being offish. Let me, um, my parents call me. I'm saying, hey, nang lomund. They're like, ah, surprise. They're like, yo, let's come see her right now. When I tell you that my wife, which is Abazalbam, Emnyang, didn't even want to, see, like, her, them to see her physically. I knew that whatever it is, that these people, these outs, external influences, they've got her. There's nothing I can say, there's nothing I can do to take her out. Whatever they, they've got her, she's possessed by whatever it is that they're using on her, you know? Um, so then after that, I told my mother, okay, fine, this Sangoma that um, called you, let's go see them. I don't believe in that stuff, but I was like, okay, let's go see them and let's also go with her. I tell her, okay, no, we want to go see this Sangoma person we want to see, because I'd even spoken to her. I said, what if Utagati, what if, you know, Bagfagili Street or something, you know what I mean? Because I'd spoken to my mother about this prior to her coming, you know? Um, and she says, hey, it's a possibility or whatever, because I'm like, you're saying that you feel some type of way. And I'm like, I don't understand why we're fighting, why we're arguing, you know? So it's fine. I tell my mother, okay, first, let's go to church, and then we'll do it after. So my parents came very early in the morning, it was even before church. So we go to the second service at church with my wife, and in that service, that sermon, right, I think that God wanted me, I, I, I've never gone to that church, it's a church that my wife had gone to a couple of times, she recommended that we go to that church, she's the one who said, let's go to this church that you've always wanted me to go to. The sermon did not move her at all. And this is a person who wanted me to come to this church. She wasn't excited that I was coming to her church finally. You know, so I was like, this behavior is weird. This is not the wife that I know and love. You know, this is a, a different person that I'm dealing with here. And in that sermon, they spoke about, um, I forgot the exact story, but there's a, a certain story of someone who was made to, 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 to sow on barren land. You know? And he said, no, but God... Like, this land has yielded nothing. Nothing has grown here. And God said, this is, where, this is the land that I want you to, um, um, to sow on. You know? And um, 
I think that was at the point in time where, in my mind, I was thinking, okay, this is a completely different person that I'm dealing with now. What do I do? Do I say, you know what, let me cut my losses? Or do I say, you know what, let me support, let me love. Let me extend that love to say, even though I don't like you right now, even though the things that you're doing hurt me, let me love you. Let me forgive you. Because clearly, I've tried to express to you the pain that I've been going through, and you haven't been able to see that. And clearly, that has given a gap for you to be convinced or, or, or poisoned against me. And now, I cannot now um, cut you off because you've been poisoned against me, because that would be going against my vows. That would be going against everything that I've promised you. I've promised my wife that it doesn't matter what season she's in. I'm there to support her. And that's how I'll show her love. You know, even if um, she's fighting against me, you know, I'll show her love by loving her through that stage. And um, that sermon really got to me. So I, was, I decided then to stay in this barren land. We leave the church sermon and all of a sudden, immediately, in the car. How? Now we're having an argument about nothing. And I'm dropping her off. Hi. After I drop off a call, my mother, I say, no, we need to go see that Sangoma person because this Tito thing or whatever it is, I, I suspect it now. Because now I don't understand what we're fighting about, what we're arguing over. You know, there's nothing actually to fight about. There's actually no reason why we're arguing. She, like, you know, she never said any reason why she had to leave the house or anything. Um, so my mother then calls her. We get on a three-way call. To say, okay, fine, you know, we want to take Umsamolo to go see this person, you know, we want to see what's wrong. We're not taking you to go see this person, we're just asking for permission because we don't want it to be done behind your back. We want whatever is said there, you to be there, to witness it. You know what I mean? Um, we have that call, cool. Then they call her again. My parents now, without me on the call. Uh, this is now, I'm on my way to meet, um, to go pick them up so that we can go to her. Um, where she's staying. She was staying at an Airbnb at the time that she was around. My mother then calls me a couple minutes later to say, oh, now Kuku's too deep. And I'm like, what? She's like, yes. I'm like, no. What did she say? She says, You know? Not as famous. People are creating you. Hold on, hold on, my friend. Oi, oi. So, <laughs> this is what you mean, wherever you go. People, people and, are and, and, you and, from and, the but, street. No, <laughs> But can you see who it is? It's not a guy in a suit. It's a guy who's walking. They are just guys in the streets. Sure. Sure. That's the power of the internet, man. You know, and, and, and that's it. Um, so, a person who touches hearts of genuine people, the ordinary person. You can't destroy my image. You can say whatever you want about me. That guy who's walking in the streets, when he sees me walking past, he's gonna say, he doesn't care what's happening on Twitter. Um, so that whole entire incident, we went to the Airbnb with my parents before we went to the Sangwama person to actually see what's going on. And you know, so that my mother could speak to my wife personally to say, what you just said, like, you know, is really hurtful. I never thought that Umakotwam would ever like Angtug. And, and that's not how, you know, you've behaved. You've always had an open relationship with us. You've always been able to openly communicate with us. Like, we don't understand where this behavior is coming from. On the drive, on the way, my parents said, you know, clearly there's something that's going on with her. This is not the person that they know. This is not the Makoti that they know. You know, and um, we went to go to see this Sangoma person. They had their uh, uh, speech telling me I need to now pay. They've already now charged my parents 45000 to save my life on my birthday. So I'm still alive. So I guess I must thank them <laughs> somehow for that. <laughs> and then... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> uh, no worries, no worries. so then, after listening to that, you know, 
I thought to myself, no, man. My whole life, we've never believed in these things. You know, my mother is someone who's always believed in church and God, and I'm seeing her do something that she doesn't even believe in. Now, my mother is also very emotional, so I know that she's being emotional. I need to be the person who's rational here. She's desperate. They've already conned her. She's already spent 45000 whatever. For her to spend 45000 she's obviously believing in whatever is happening. You understand? They wanted even more money out of me to do other things, to get other things or whatever, other processes, you know, even more money out of me. Or so maybe I'm thinking, introduce a Ketlele as a Ketlele as a Ketlele scoop. So, yeah. <laughs> Dr. So, Ketlele. You know, Shout out to Dr. Ketlele. <laughs> so, yeah, the thing is that about Dr. Ketlele is that they don't have a badge where you can tell that this is a real one. You know? So, there are people able to con you. My mother has never had a famous son. She doesn't know how it is to have the media call you. She doesn't know how it is to have people call you saying, hey, this is, this is what happened. She doesn't know how it is to have a YouTube link sent to you. Hey, such and such is happening. So for her, she's a person who doesn't know how to deal with that situation. She's trying to protect her son. She's panicking. She's not behaving rationally. She's behaving illogically. I express this to my wife. I tell her on the phone. I say, you know, we went through this person. I say, yeah, I've listened to this thing. They want me to pay this much money. I'm saying, I'm not going to do it. You know, I expressed that to my wife. I wanted to, her to know the whole entire process. And, and I already told her that, listen, whatever happened between you and the parents, you swearing at the parents, Mina, I'm forgiving you. I'm taking it as if whatever it is that's possessing you, that's what did that. It's not you, you know. Um, and um, from, from that point onwards, you know, um, Things didn't didn't improve. So things didn't get better. She spoke to her her parents, and you see, the problem with my family situation is that um, my wife's parents live in New Zealand, and they've lived there since you know the financial collapse in two thousand and eight, and they had to immigrate from Zimbabwe. So she hasn't been living with her parents her entire adult life. She, she started by studying, yeah. You know, she, she, she was in South Africa on a student visa for the whole entire time, you know. Um, and so I never got the opportunity to, to ever meet my in-laws personally. I've never had a face-to-face -face conversation with them. And um, they don't know me personally, you know. And... Um, It hurt me that they didn't take whatever little effort. I understand there's been lockdown or whatever, you know. Um, but lockdown is over now to come and see me. Um, it's, it's not, we, we don't struggle for the financial means to book a flight, you know. Whether for, for me to go to New Zealand, for them to come here. And um, they haven't been supportive in assisting us to find each other to 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 get the communication going. So so where are you guys getting the help from? Are you even trying to get help? Um, are you healing, man? Yeah. So the, the the my problem is that my wife has got no help whatsoever. She's got no help. The only people that are around her are people that are trying to milk her for her money, or whatever money they think they can make out of her or whatever career that they think. So she's just confused. She's being confused by the people around her. Listen, I pray for you guys, man. Um, you guys are such an incredible couple, you know? You know? Her, her, her uncles who live here are unable to get through to her. She's refusing to even be summoned to have a meeting. Um, I've been trying to get us into marriage counseling the whole entire time because for me, you know, she's not in a stage where I'm ready to have her come back. So, uh, don't, so you think this will, don't you think first. this will cause more damage, talking about it in public? Um, you see, the, the, the one main thing, the one main thing that made me decide to say I want to have a public life was that I felt that a lot of people who do live a public life live a facade have to put on a show. 
they they don't have to be vulnerable. They, 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 there's no value in authenticity. So what I wanted to be able to do was role model authenticity, which means you will see me when I'm up, you will see me when I'm down, you will see all the different colors to show you that a human being can go through all these phases and still make it through. When we spoke with um, Penwell here, I said that what I'm going through is going to be a testament for someone else, it's going to give strength. I said, I'm literally a man on fire right now as we speak. And I couldn't give the details like publicly because she hadn't spoken about it as well. And we always want to be unfair to ourselves as men to give women the benefit. Let it not be me who speaks about it first. But I cannot now silence myself and not be able to speak about what I'm going through because this is exactly what we say, that men don't speak about what they're going through. We complain about that. And then when a man speaks about what he's going through, oh, he's soft now. Or maybe, you know, he's simping or... You understand? Oh, he's a joke. He has a laughing stock. That's it. Mm. And we, we can never speak about it. And mm. then you end up slapping Chris Rock at the Oscars. Because you could not express yourself fully. You know? And you are expected to go through it. You are expected to accept your wife cheating with August Alsina in the house. It's August when we're recording this. So I'm gonna, I pray for you guys. I really pray. And as I repeat, uh, you guys are an, such an incredible couple. I just hope that things get sorted. And without having to dwell more on your story, let's talk about just the concept of marriage itself. You guys got married at a young age. You're a young couple. What, what young are some age. of the things? Yeah, you're young. You guys are relatively no, young. No, you guys no, are young people. No, you guys are not no. 40. You're not 40 yet. I'm 30. You know? Yeah, you're young. Young age is if she, you get married at 21. She's in her 20s. You're no, still she's young. No, she's not. She's 30. That's what I mean. You guys are young, though. You guys are she's like... 31. You guys are 13 years younger than me. She's 31. That's I'm 30, 32. That I'm young. And you guys are 13 years younger than me. So that's what I mean. There's, there's a lot of teachable moments. You know? What are some... A of woman that's married at 31 is not young. Let's, let's be real. I, I totally agree. Yes, I agree. She's 31. But she is a young person. You guys no, are... No, no, you're also not. a young as person. As a woman, as, I'm 32 years old. My father had his first child at 32. A 65-year-old, when, they, was, look, when they look at unusual. you guys, you are so young. Yes, I understand that. But when it comes to like just society, young is in your 20s when you're too young for marriage. When you're too young for marriage, you're in your 18, 19, that's stuff. If you're after 25, you're old now. And I didn't say you guys were, are too young for marriage. I didn't mm, say that. Mm, I said you guys are a, young. a young couple. Right. Yeah, in terms of like our our the youth of our relationship. Yeah, and there's a lot of people are going through the same. People maybe they don't even talk about it in public. Yeah. So a lot of men are going through it because the media right now is continuing the destruction and the dehumanization of the black man. There isn't a black man who doesn't have his wife influenced by Instagram. My wife will have everything, but Instagram will tell her that she doesn't have the new Louis Vuitton bag. And she's a wife. Someone's side chick has got the new Louis Vuitton bag. My wife will have everything. But Instagram will tell her that someone's side chick is being taken to Dubai. But equally so, vice versa. You can have everything at home. Your, life, your wife looks after you. You've got a great loving family. But you're being influenced by Instagram as a guy as well. You Even understand? Vice versa. I, I'm instru- but the, the thing is this. If my wife comes back and says to me, she wants a wife allowance. Because she saw on Instagram, a video of Mithali saying she, she's, got, she's got a girlfriend alliance with Boiti. She's now taking what she's learned, on, what she's seen on Instagram and bringing it into our household. Me, Instagram, every girl that looks like my wife is shown to me on Explorer feed. Every girl. I've got the choice and the option to now also engage, entertain, to send an, a DM. I can afford to send a DM. I can afford to buy her a bottle at the club and entertain her for the night. I can afford to book a room at a hotel. I can do that, but I choose not to. Why? Because I respect my marriage. So the same penalty that is there for a husband who looks on Instagram and sees someone nice is the same penalty that we need to apply for women who see values on Instagram and want to incorporate them into their own household at the detriment of their partner. When I say at the detriment of their partner, I'm talking about the things that you see outside that are at the detriment of your partner. Not everything that you see outside is a bad influence. But there are certain things that are bad influences. And not every person gets easily influenced by social media. You understand? 
But every person and does. And not every person no. is aware when they're being influenced by, by social media. media. Mm. But every person gets influenced by social media. Every person gets influenced by the, the media. The media is a brainwashing tool. It influences you. My wife did not think the implications of asking me, her husband, to give her a wife allowance. She did not think, what am I thinking in the back of my head? She did not think, my husband will think, where did I get this from? Why am I saying this? She explained herself and she rationalized it. But after a while, I said, no. I said, what I will be able to do for you is that I'll book you a spa, a Renaissance, a Renaissance spa at the Michelangelo Towers. Every month you can go to the spa, do a facial, whatever. That's me pampering you. That I'll spend money on that. But I can't buy the groceries in the house, pay for the bills, pay the rent, pay everything. And then on top of that, also pay you for being my wife. Because you saw something on Instagram that says that, you know, girlfriends are getting girlfriend allowance. What are wives getting? Because now you're jealous of Mithali. And at the detriment of our black sisters as well, because they're the ones that are being sold cheaply on Instagram. They're the ones that are paying the highest price when we're seeing it through the femicide wave, when we're seeing it through um, uh, the acts of violence against women in nightclubs, in drinking spots, everywhere where women are. They are vulnerable. Why? Because there are a lot of women who are willing to sell themselves short. Too many women who are willing to sell themselves short and training society to devalue women in general. And the same way they say men are trash, right? And then they paint all of us with the same brush. When women behave like quote-unquote hoes and are selling themselves, men then also think that all women are hoes and they can treat them like that. And they can dehumanize them as well. And when I spoke about it and I said the dehumanization of black women in particular, where we can take the most popular woman on social media in South Africa right now is Mithali. It's undoubtedly. We know that. Anything you say about Mithali is, is, is bound to trend. She's the most influential woman. She's, she's influential enough to make my wife ask me for a wife allowance. So I can just imagine how else she's influential. She's influential enough to make my wife want to learn how to do her own makeup. You understand? In the mirror. So that's how influential she is. And this influence is on the pretext that she makes her money off of doing YouTube tutorials and everything else. But the truth of the matter is that that's not where she makes her money off of. Once we get the, to the truth of the matter and we say, okay, fine, there's no um, punishment for, you know, lying about the source of your income, then we then normalize the true source of the income. Then when we analyze what is the true source of this income, it's basically saying that as a woman, you need to make yourself attractive to men so that you can find a man that will bless you and sponsor you and treat you like an object. But what's wrong with that though? What that does is that it does, in effect, what I just spoke about prior. It dehumanizes the woman. And the same reason why black men get killed and no one bats an eyelid is because the black man has been dehumanized. So if you dehumanize the black woman too, she will be killed and no one will bat an eyelid. During apartheid times, black men were fighting. Black men were being shot at. When black men were being shot at and being uh, 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 fired at, there was nothing wrong with that. When they brought women into their fights, then there were no guns being fired because even the apartheid state knew that, okay, we can't fire at women and children. So when women had that march in 56, they knew that the apartheid state is not going to fire at them. They're not going to fire at women because they don't pose a threat. When you now objectify women and bring them down to the same level that you brought down the black man, you are now normalizing femicide. You are now normalizing gender-based violence because they see the black woman as something that is less than human in the same way as they see the black man as something that is less than human, which is why when Chris Honey is shot dead at his house, they can show you his body and you can see the brutality of them bringing down one of your strongest guys. You understand? But the person at the, at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the barrel globally is the black woman. No, it's, it's the black, black man. It's the black no. woman. It's, it's a black woman. Anyone who says that has been brainwashed by the media because 
the black woman has the black man's st- shoulders to stand on. The black man is the one that takes the bullets when the oppressor is coming and committing genocide. The reason why our population is skewed in favor of women is because men die in their youth, especially black men. The riskiest time for a black man is between the ages of 14 and 24. In that 10-year band, that's when most black men die. When you look at the stats of who goes into university, black women are the ones who are entering university. Black women are the biggest benefactors of our new free freedoms um, um, post-apartheid. The biggest losers are the black men. Black men are the ones who people lock their doors off when they're walking past them in traffic because a black man is viewed as a criminal. When white people now have their companies and they want to have diversity, the diversity officer, the HR officer, is a black woman. The lady at reception is a black woman. Why? Because you can't put a little criminal black man at the front desk. And we are not seeing this because the elite, the white elite, that are on top of the whole entire system, they benefit from the dehumanization of the black man. They can't do it directly, but they can get the black women to do it on their behalf. See, what they do is the attack is actually against the black family. It's breaking up the black family. And as other people would say out there is um, emasculating the black man. Mm. But when you look at... Dehumanizing him, not even emasculating him. Because when you're saying emasculation, you're saying that the black man is on a different level than the black woman in the first place. As in he's in a, in a place of dominance. I'm not comparing the no, black I man understand with the that. black woman. No, no. Okay, okay. What I'm saying, emasculation is usually to say you are feminizing, right? And when you feminize, and, and the way in which um, um, uh, 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 masculinity has been paternalized by uh, the West, by um, uh, Europeans, masculinity has been paternalized to s- mean that women are, are subject to men. And men are dominant over women. Whereas in our African culture, we don't have different genders. A man and a woman are, are both human. And they serve different roles. We've got different roles in society. We don't have different gen- genders. So we don't ascribe a different level of humanity to men and women. Whereas with the paternalism of the Westerners, they ascribe a seniority to the man. And then after that comes the white woman. And then below that come the other races. And the other races are defined by the men. The women are not even um, affected into that. So it'd be the Jews, um, um, the Arabs, um, uh, uh, the blacks, the, the Chinese, etc., etc. You know, all the Chinese, blacks, etc., etc. From that system downwards. So when you say they emasculate the man, you're using their system. And their system says that the man is above the woman. And language is a very powerful tool because we understand meaning through language. So by using their language, what you're saying is that black men are now being reduced to the same level as black women. Inadvertently. That's not what you're trying to say. But that's what you're saying because you use the word, they emasculate the men. So I'll I'll repeat again and say, according to me, these are my Mm. personal opinion and I'll take Mm. the flag for it. I obviously stand to be corrected as well because I might not have all the stats, but she's the one that is the most raped even from the beginning of time when our land was taken. Nope. She's the one that is uh, paid the least. Nope. Out of everybody. Nope. She's the, and, and that's not the argument. I'm not trying yeah, to compare yeah. the black man and the black woman. Yeah, but I'm just saying, just factually, m- though, it's actually the opposite. The okay. black man is the most raped. This is, why, this is why the book that I was saying, I was looking for a book, A Man Not by Tommy Curry, right? Um, he's a professor in Africana Studies. I think people should Google him. Uh, just look for Tommy Curry, Tommy Curry. And he basically breaks down those stats. The black man was the one who was raped the most and brutalized the most through slave. The slave era. He was beaten down. He was the one who was um, three-fifths of a man in the American Constitution. And then when he tried to apply to get his rights as a human being, to be um, given the rights to be a human being, then they introduced women's suffrage. 
And they said, before you give the rights to the black man, you need to make sure that the white woman has her vote. And therefore, the whole entire struggle for black people had to be put on the back burner so that white women could be now put into make a greater majority for white men. It was done in a very smart way because a lot of people would always say, you know, they would hijack the plight of, of, of black people or even in America, let's talk about African-Americans. Mm. We'll talk about the civil, civil rights movement before that has yes. been infiltrated mm. by the struggle also of the white woman. But the white woman is the same one who's benefiting from the the white supremacist, the white man, man yes. the husband. Yes. And apparently it was intentionally done yes. to have our rights as we are fighting for these fights, or let's say our woman, black woman, okay. then, then they'll have the white woman join in our black woman's struggle. And, and then, then it infiltrates the struggle and what our black woman's plight is Who is raping is the, white, for, the black man? Right? But anyway, no, my, no, no, my, my point, yeah. I was trying to drive into a point yeah. earlier, but then I let you just disturb. What I wanted to say for me is, I'm, I'm personally aware this according to my experiences yeah. and how I've been viewing the world over the past couple of years. I look at it like the attack is the, the black family is under attack. Yes. And I would say to no, 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 mm. is under attack, right? Yes. And not only the black family is under attack and based mm. on the conversation we've been having mm. since Kali Lesila, mm. that's why I would say a young couple, a young incredible couple like mm. yourself. Or the potential. And, 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 and you guys are, are just one of. Mm. There's many other amazing young people where now you are starting to hear the voice getting louder and louder of guy, men going their own way, men going red pill and not needing women anymore, et cetera, et cetera. I don't cetera. agree with that. And now I don't. But mm. I mean, my concern is I understand the strength of a family unit. If you look mm. at Italians or you look at Greeks or you look at Italian the Jewish community Kappa. or you look at even the Indian community, you know how strong, yeah, how strong they are when it comes to the family unit. Now uh, in, think of in the other, Kappa sign is a man and a woman. Yeah. In other races, sometimes you're not even, even when you get married, they even will support you just in this household where you don't even have to move out and so go find your the man and the woman are not separated. It's because of the understand the power of okay. the family unit. And Tina, as black people, that's what we've been going through. Like we've been going through that attack for the longest of time. Mm. And I feel that right now, that attack is at its highest. So if a, a, a well, lot we're seeing, of... If we're a, seeing the effects of it the most now. I, I totally agree. Yeah. If a lot of young men or if a lot of young people are saying, I'm against marriage, mm. I don't want marriage because I hate my black men or, 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 or vice versa. I hate my black woman. Mm. It's exactly where they want us. That's because exactly. for me, our unity and our strength as black people is in that solid family unit. So now if the challenges that I'm going through make me turn against marriage... Who stands a chance? Because the things that I've overcome in my life, not many black men have had the opportunity to overcome. I'm a role model to many. Right now, as I'm standing in the fire, you know, people think that, okay, this is the end of it. He's finished. What about those people who are going through this in silence? who need a role model, who need someone who can make them believe who, that a, a black family is worth fighting for. Son, say that you line know? again. I like that line. A black family is worth fighting for. A bro. black family is worth fighting for. It's definitely worth fighting and so, for. so, you know, I, I like there was a, a point in time where all of this was happening, where it started happening, where I was, I was going through the worst um, time. This is before, um, you know, uh, we went... Um, uh, to go see that song or my, just check on my wife or whatever, you know, right um, as she left, before um, I took a break uh, from social media. It was the day before Patrick Shai took his life, actually. Um, the, actually, the day before that, on the 19th, you know? DJ Ankle Tap is attacking me. Um, uh, uh, Pearl Tusi is attacking me. And what I said... In those attacks, I, was, I said, guys, what I'm fighting for is the black family. And I understand maybe some people might be confused about the way I'm going about my fight, right? I don't expect everybody to know me well enough to trust my intentions. I, I, like, you know what I mean? I don't expect, but you're going to watch me fight this fight. And you're going to see me being put through hell, being dragged through hell. Because the system does not want the black family to succeed. 
If you want to see how much they don't want the black family to succeed, look at the hell that they're putting me through. Because I'm fighting for the black family to succeed. I'm fighting for family values. I'm saying, guys, let us not be celebrating when um, um, people's marriages are being broken up or um, uh, uh, side chicks are, are, are coming up or whatever. Let us not have that culture. Women, they can't be celebrating Women's Day when there are women who are breaking other women's marriages. Because they've got nothing to celebrate. Because clearly they don't respect one another. You know what I mean? Us, we don't have a men's day to celebrate. And, okay, that's fine. We don't have anything to celebrate. But we've got a lot of introspection to do as men and say, how are we contributing to the society that we're in? There's a lot of men who are enabling a lot of the toxicity that we are seeing. Me, myself, I told myself, okay, I'm not going to partake in this thing of being a blesser. Because that's the level that you upgrade yourself to. You start at the level where you're a hustler, you're grinding, women don't look at you because they're hypergamous and only men with money get women. So you're part of that sexless minority of young black boys in South Africa right now who girls their age don't even look at them. The buster 929s of this world. Because no girl who's between the age of 24 or 23 or 22 even you know, 22 is five years younger than Pastor 929. Is looking at a guy like Pastor 929. They're looking at 40-something-year-olds, 50-something-year-olds, people, you know, with money. And when I, as a Pastor 929, to appeal to women your age group, you now need to have a V-class like a 50-year-old. You need to have the latest Mercedes-Benz like a 40-year-old who's able to attract women of your age group. But still, they don't want you because you are too young. You, you actually don't really have that money. You can't afford that lifestyle. So now, what do you do? You are now grooming the younger girls who are just barely legal. And it affects you negatively. And the system that you find yourself now supporting is corrupting young girls. Because those young girls that uh, are out of your dating league now were corrupted at, at, the, at this very young age, at an early age. And you might be or have enough money to benefit from it right now, but you're destroying the future. We, we're not seeing how society is all interlinked and how all of us need to be accountable um, for our behavior. And I always say to Amachi that when you're young, it's not your fault if girls your age are not gravitating towards you. Mm. My advice has always been rather focus on your, on your purpose, on your mm. hustle, and build on your yourself. own personal development mm. because it's, it's, there's nothing wrong about you. You have not even started working. You are just barely starting to work. You're probably still hustling or you're still finishing your degree or you just started working. You're, you're looking for that promotion. You just started your company. You're still in your 20s. You'll only have money after you've been working at least for 10 years, at least in your 30s. Mm. Obviously, in your 40s, you'll have money. People like us, we've been working for a while. Mm. And then, Nati, we've gone through that. When I was a young man at, at, at Verts and... Mm. Back in those days. You know? That was the days. And now, now I understand I'm older. I'm like, wow, younger girls are messing with guys my age. Younger mm. girls are what about you know young guys their age? Now think about okay, let's move. Guys their age are busy on Yaope. If they're not building their lives. So there's two things that are happening. A lot of men are being destroyed by this and a lot of men are, are building their lives because of this. A lot of women are destroying their lives because you get to the age of 30, you're not as attractive as the young 19-year-old who is attracted to these older men because that lifestyle has been normalized. No one's going to say then, anything. And then, the, then, and then the guy's value starts rising. You understand? Because now he's getting into his 30s. He's starting to become stable. And he's built himself. His finances are growing. He's not in debt. He wasn't paying off his girlfriend's Edgar's account or going to Diamond Walk to buy her Gucci sneakers so that she's not taken by a blesser. You understand what I'm saying? So he's able to build himself. But a lot of other men are destroyed because they're left out of the system and they turn to drugs, crime, and everything else. So there's two things. There's two things that are happening. And then a lot of women now who build their lives and build themselves up, right, are also taken out of the dating circle. So you're finding a lot of professional sisters who are in their 30s, whatever, good women who would have been dating, but the men that they're seeing around them, right, don't want them because there's so many cheaper women available. And when I say cheaper women, what I mean is that 
women who are devaluing themselves by commodifying their bodies. So if a guy can take you out to a nightclub by buying a bottle at the table, you are commodifying yourself. If a guy now needs to actually have good conversation, he takes you out and you pay your own bill. He cannot buy your time. He, he cannot. You know what I mean? You are at his mercy. It's, it's because you want to give him your time. You're, you're voluntarily giving it to you. Now, you cannot give your time to enough men to stop the damage that is being done by women who are selling their time cheaply. And that stops men from actually seeing women as anything less than objects. And the objectification of women doesn't only start with the most influential women, the one who trends on Twitter all the time. You know, it starts with all these women that we're seeing at the nightclubs, at the parties and everything else. It starts there. And it permeates because it's normalized by the influential women that we're seeing on social media, that we're seeing on TV, that we're seeing on Forbes, 30 under 30, or whatever the case may be, under whatever pretext it is. And we're literally watching our society being broken up and broken down, and we're doing nothing about it. But then you've got other sisters, Gay, where in, when they're young, they've got the focus. They don't have the time, they're pushing their careers, and then they get into their, let's say, 30s. And actually, most women do better than guys, um, academically. And Not only academically. Yeah, well, in, in, in a whole lot of other things as well. But career-wise, you'll find that there's also a lot of young sisters when getting into their 30s, they're doing well. They're not getting money from, from men. They're not getting money from blessers. They're building their careers. Some of them, they've built their careers already. Maybe they're even on their second car. Mm. They're even on their second title deed mm. in their early 30s. Mm. And, and then, and then you that? find what it's difficult now for that guy to get that sister because he probably thinks she's out of his league. It's not only that. That's one thing. But what you're missing is the part where they benefit from what men had to die for. Because everything that you're talking about, the progressing of our sisters, the progressing of women, they didn't have to go and dig in the mines for that. Yes, there are women who are in mining now. Yes, there are women who go underground now. That It's been opened up so that women can go underground. But for the women to be able to go underground right now, a lot of men are still underground, are still in unmarked graves. The brutality of the system that built everything that we call our economy today was felt by the black man. And after the, the brutality is met out onto the black man, right? he's still demonized, he's still classified as less than human, he's still made into a mongrel, he's still uh, made into a monster, right? And then he's then castrated. <laughs> because if you don't have enough money now, as a man, you cannot find someone who will settle down with you. You cannot find someone who you can build a family with. So you cannot reproduce. And your sole purpose as a human being, which is to reproduce, the first thing that God put you on this earth for is to procreate more. You are unable to do that. What level of depression befalls a man who is unable to do the one thing he was brought onto this earth to do? Do you read or do you listen to Jordan Peterson? Yeah. Okay, I could tell. Okay. <laughs> yeah. For those who don't know Jordan Peterson, go search him on, actually even here on, on this platform on YouTube. Yeah. Go check him out. Amazing, amazing videos. Yeah, I introduced my wife to Jordan Peterson as well. Incredible, incredible rhetoric as, yeah. as far as what we've been talking about. Yeah. Especially with what men have been going through over the past The problem with Jordan years. Peterson is that he can't speak on behalf of black men and he doesn't know what yeah. we've been through. In Gamla. And... Um, it's an elite. That's why I'm mean, in my white talk. I'm, in my talk, I'm very, very careful to not speak on behalf of the black woman because I'm not a woman, right? And I've never been. Well, look, I I find that ridiculous. That as black men, we cannot speak about black men and women or black people in general. You can speak about, but not on behalf of. Yeah, exactly. We sure. should speak about. We shouldn't be finding ourselves silenced. You know, so. The level at which the black man has been dehumanized is that we even ignore the, the, the rape stats. The fact that white women used to rape black men. And then when they were caught out, they would say, no, the black man raped me, and then he'd be executed and hanged. Because they were curious, because they heard that black men have bigger penises. And now, 
that abuse that has been meted out by so, women. So wrong, so wrong. Black men, people are they, they have bigger penises. And, and what's the point there, sorry? So white women were intrigued. Oh, okay. You know, the colonial <laughs> masters, they came here, right? They've got slaves that they own. Well, where does Mandingo come from? Mandingo, it comes from slave times. They used to take their Mandingos and make them fight. That's the whole entire thing. And it's a porn genre. So white women used to rape black men. Black men have been raped in front of their families, brutalized, beaten up in front of their families and their wives. The women were spared the brunt of this brutality that we faced through the genocide that uh, uh, we've experienced from slavery or even prior to that. The black man has been brutalized for his strength. Why? Because the black man, thanks to um, eugenicists and like one of the big eugenics um, teachers in South Africa was Clive Darby Lewis. Do you know a, a lady called Margaret Singer? Yeah, but, yeah, cool. yeah, 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 exactly. She was one of them as well. Yes, one uh, of the Planned biggest, Parenthood. One of the Planned biggest, Parenthood. They hide it in a Planned Parenthood, but initially it was eugenics, bro. No, it, it is was a study of eugenics. Everything yeah. stemmed from eugenics. Abu Makar is saying on the time of Bill Gates, and that's and, what and they were pushing. So yeah. now the, it, it stemmed from what would happen after they rape these black men. They'd fall pregnant, so now they needed to find a way to stop falling pregnant to show evidence that they've been raping these black slaves. They needed to stop the, the, the evidence. The men also now also needed to stop the evidence that they've been um, uh, um, raping the female slaves. See, what you're talking about, I want to take our audiences to this book. I've just forgotten the name of this no, book, No, you can man. search the book while I speak. Yes, yes, while so, you speak, yeah. So, so the eugenicists, basically, have been... Willie Lynch. Willie Lynch, yes. What a satanic book. You understand? So, yes. By the way, uh, anyway... I'll talk about it. Just but, continue there. Yeah, so. yeah. So, so they've been trying to study the black race for the longest time, trying to create all these lies, to, told us that we're a different race, we're less intelligent, we're inferior, because we're superior. White supremacy is based on the fact that they're inferior. They've got recessive genes, and they realize that we, we will breed them out, and there's nothing they can do to stop it. Black people will eventually dominate the world. Do you think that's the reason for um, transhumanism currently with what they would call the current new world order? I, no, no, no. Because um, transhumanism no, no, I, is, is, yeah, is taking yeah. human, humans onto another dimension. Now, Not dimension per now, se. Now, it's the same thing. It's Basically, the Baslang and Nisane. No. It's not that, the transhumans. But it, let, let me finish okay. off this Willie Lynch letter that I was talking about. The name of the book is called The Willie Lynch Letter. Ne? They call it The Making of a Slave. It's one of the most controversial uh, books, African-American studies, and it was purportedly written by a, a slave owner, Willie Lynch. Mm. So go, ch go check that out. or You can even listen to some discussions, um, some discussion topics around it online. Or you can even listen to the audio book or some people reading it on, on even here on YouTube. The most satanic, the most evil book on how the slave owner came up with ideas on how he can teach the rest of the world or other slave masters how to break down the black man. Ah, oh, what a so, dreadful book. But one, anyway. Once they proved to themselves that the black man was completely genetically identical to the white man, right? That was an inconvenient truth. They then decided that, okay, fine, we're going to use this black man for all our experiments. So the black man became a lab rat. They could test everything, whether it be hair remover, every, whatever you, you name it. You can test it on black people, just like you the test... Kiss, the Kissinger report. The, 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 the studies like, that were done then. You understand? How, how many black, black lives were annihilated? You, they were able to do everything to black people. Now, they needed um, a politically palatable excuse to be able to do that. They needed a politically palatable excuse to be able to do that. Because they were doing that merely because they wanted to have a scientific, or so they say it's scientific. To them, it was scientific at the time. Imagine the fact that black people were inferior was science at a, a certain point in time. It makes you wonder when they tell you trust the science, what are they asking you to actually trust? Because this science once told us that we are three-fifths of a human being at a certain point in time. That's what the science said. 
So they dehumanize the black man to the point where they can perform experiments on him, they can skin him, they can take his organs, chop them up, do a whole number of experience, uh, experiments on the black man. And then once now the world is awakening and seeing that these are atrocities that are being committed, they need to find new ways to mask their atrocities. So they create the victimhood of the white woman, as if she's not the lab assistant when they're skinning the black man inside that lab. So they've seen that, okay, fine, we demonized ourselves through our actions and through our atrocities. There's no way they'll ever look at white men as great. The only way we can make ourselves look great is if we agree that we are great and we convince the world through propaganda that we are great. And we protect ourselves from ever being really criticized. So they are able to do that and they say, okay, fine, let's give women the right to vote, white women the right to vote. So now we say, okay, yes, uh, white women are completely innocent of everything that white men have done because white women weren't even allowed to vote. So you can't say that they voted for any of these atrocities. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So now this victimhood needs to create a new wave of activism called feminism, which only starts arising in the 1970s, where white women now associated themselves as separate from their families. They wanted to get divorces. They wanted to do all these things. They wanted to separate themselves. Now, I've got a theory that Bill Gates and his wife, uh, Melinda, uh, got divorced because he's about to be investigated for atrocities. That's my theory. That's you what I told so? my wife. That's what I think, you know, for certain things. Because there's no way she wouldn't have known everything that was up to and is only divorcing him now, you know. And it can't be about girls on the side because at the level of money that they've got, those aren't issues that they face. And there's also another conspiracy theory of why Bill Gates was hanging around about Jeffrey Epstein. Th that, 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 those revelations, as all of those uh, things. Especially as far as um, human, but in testing human trafficking, trials, everything. Not only just trafficking, yes, but yes. just human testing. -ish. There's but, just yeah. It's another. It's another. But in rabbit hole. No, no I'll get into it's it a topic now. For another I'll, day. No, but I'll get into it now. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get. I'll, I'll get into without going into the human testing and everything else. Right. So when the feminism waves comes in, it's now led mostly by the lesbian women. They're the ones who are mostly pro women's right, because they're saying that this world is not geared up for women who don't have a man beside them. If we are choosing not to partner up with men, then we are losing. So we need rights as well. And then because they're lesbian, that falls them under uh, the broader category um, of LGBTQ. You understand? So then they had allyship from the gay community, you know, which was predominantly white in general. Right? The gay community then comes under attack as soon as it's revealed that um, the spike in HIV um, infections after they'd been discovered in the early 80s. Um, was mostly in uh, men that sleep with men, so gay men and white men um, in particular. So they couldn't even drive that narrative that it's a black virus in the States at that point in time because they were more out openly and outwardly gay white men than they were black men. And they are just more white men in general than they are black men in that country. So they couldn't um, 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 openly and outwardly um, exploit um, uh, that. Then we move on to now communism is about to fall. Um, the Americans create a new weapon um, uh, uh, called uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, MERS. You might have heard of it. It happened in the 80s. They dropped MERS. It was in the war in Israel. It was a chemical weapon, a virus, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, just like coronaviruses today. Um, and there's no zoonotic um, escape. It never came from an animal. It came from a lab. It was made in a lab as a chemical weapon. So we know that in the 80s, they were able to create viruses in a lab that they could spread out. HIV then starts getting spread in Africa, right? And the theory is that they're researching 
whether HIV comes from um, uh, yes the eating of chimpanzees in Central and West Africa or bushmeat. Mm. But the HIV infection rate is highest in Southern Africa where monkeys and chimpanzees are not consumed or not eaten. So you're That's bringing where it's in other conversations now. Also, I think during the lockdown, there was also that trending video of some of the things that the apartheid government did back then to our communities, especially they're even specific about mentioning townships like Abu Katlehung, Abu Tembisa, Abu Alexandra, about posing as uh, um, doctors and coming up with clinics that and seemed infecting to be, and injecting oh, people. Man, so to, now to our parents. To, and now, at the time, some of us were either young or were not born. So throughout the eighties. When HIV was spreading in white communities in Europe, in, in the Americas, it was seen as a gay virus, especially amongst um, uh, gay white men, right? Um, all of a sudden, once it came to South Africa, which had now newly been freed, democracy, uh, brought a, sponsored by the CIA, yeah. all of a sudden, we had the highest HIV infection rate and um, it was exploding everywhere. Nelson Mandela then, in 1997, decided that he was going to break the law. He was going to take the advice from Fidel Castro and um, make the country acquire generic AIDS drugs. This was when Dr. Fauci was fighting to keep the patents on HIV drugs, because the argument was that if we drop patents, yes, fine, it will be easier to access this drug and it will save a lot of lives, but it will discourage research. Because the, the topic that you're talking about, sorry to disturb you, you must go check out, guys, a documentary called Plandemic. Mm. Um, there's a lady called Dr. Judy Mikovic. Mm. Judy Mikovits. Mm. She's talking about exactly what you're talking about yeah. and what happened at that time, Gabo Fauci, and apparently, well, that's what she's saying, yeah. apparently, allegedly, what she's saying on that documentary is that the HIV virus was created. Well, And she talks, she even mentions... I talk about MERS. She even mentions Dr. Fauci's name, which yeah. was also one of the people who was involved then, because yeah. her, herself, or Dr. Judy Mikovic, back then she was working with them. She says she was one of the people who was with them at the lab. And yeah. she speaks about this. She's been silenced. And I think she's had uh, numerous times attempts on her life. Uh, and I think they try to take her to jail to destroy her life, according to what she's saying. So I'd like to encourage people to go search for, I don't know if YouTube still have it, has it, but they keep deleting it there. The documentary is called Pla Plandemic, not Pandemic, but Plandemic. The doctor's name is Judy Mikovic. Sorry, continue. So yeah, so in 1997, he then decided to take the advice of Fidel Castro because um, Cuba had already been making generic uh, drugs and they were getting lawsuits from America to say, hey, stop making generic drugs. And he did that and uh, his presidency ended before South Africa won that fight legally in court. We only won it in 2004 when George W. Bush um, signed the deal with Dr. Anthony Fauci. And that is the reason why we weren't able to import ARVs in this country for the longest time, when they said Tabum Beki is killing us by saying HIV doesn't cause AIDS and whatever. As much as he might have given misinformation, the truth of the matter is that had we taken the drugs that were being offered initially, it would have bankrupted the country and the country would still be bankrupt and wouldn't be able to have this ARV rollout um, um, that was the best ARV rollout in the world um, during the Zuma presidency. So that was the big sacrifice that uh, Nelson Mandela and Thabo Mbeki made that dented their legacies. But when we look at these black men and we look at the things that they've had to overcome and the things that they've had to do, we don't judge them with the same lens that we judge white men. I mean, no one speaks about all the atrocities that were committed by Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill ordered for um, gas to be used in the First World War. Um, I think it was on the 16th of August. And um, John Kelly John Sherwood Kelly, Jack Sherwood Kelly, a South African um, a soldier, 
in the First World War, were fighting in, in the British forces, um, made the decision to disobey the order and not guess um, uh, the Bolsheviks who they were fighting against. Um, those are the people that led the Russian Revolution. And um, he was discharged for that, dishonored, even though he's got his Victoria's, made a Victoria's Cross. And um, that was like a war crime, you know, to gas people. Like even today, we talk about Putin, oh, he's so evil. Winston Churchill was ordering for people to be gassed back then. Yes, it was still in the early days of gassing people, but he ordered for people to be gassed, white but, people to be gassed. But even the current American president, Joe Biden, at some point, I don't know if he was a senator, but at some point, and, and not only him, even yes, Kamala Harris, drugs. even his vice, yes. he, they took hundreds of thousands of a lot of African-American black men into prison. They, they signed that bill into law. Back Joe then, Biden said back that then. Jamal Khashoggi, and not, uh, 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 his murder was a crime, and that um, uh, 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 Mohammed bin Salman uh, is you know, a war criminal, and he should be treated like a pariah. And just a couple uh, weeks ago, you know, Joe Biden was there offering him weapons and accepting oil from him. So, I mean, again, we've seen atrocities. And these atrocities are committed by the white elite. Why is it that when we look at the black man, we look at him as a savage? When the black man is not the one who exterminated all those Jews like Hitler did. When the black man is not the one who invented all these chemical weapons, nuclear weapons, all these bombs, all these guns, all these things that kill, all this destruction that is in the world that we're crying out against is not done by the black man. But when we look at the black man, we look at him as the biggest rapist, the biggest savage, you know? So that was intentionally done. Because you know, when when, not only when I study our people, just based on my own upbringing and my own experiences of growing up in Lokshini, people I've interacted with, black people I've seen and worked with, black people that love me, that raised me. To tell you the truth, and I think a lot of people agree with me on this statement, black people are the most kindest people in the world. It's been 28 years. It's been 28 years. They are forgiving, Since they are the kind. Since the whites said that we're going to slaughter they, them. Ah, Clive Joby Lewis said, if you give uh, the black government power, us as black men, we still haven't slaughtered nobody. white people. We still, they, there's genocide that they, but we are victims of genocide. We have been slaughtered, we've been mutilated, we've been raped, we've been beaten, we've been brutalized by white people. But white people are seen as angels, as our saviors. Our oppressors are viewed as our saviors, even right now. So, after everything I've told you, after everything I've said to destroy the black man, why would my wife love me as a black man? No, Tabaloi, let's hold it there. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> like, you know, everything has been told to people, whether white women, black women, Indian, everything, is let's dehumanize the black man. Let's make him a monster. A black man is not something you can love. So I need to now rise above that. As unloved as we are as black people, as unloved as we are as black men, because we face the brunt of the brutality of the hatred the world has meted out against our people, right? We face the brunt of the... We need to now show what love is. We need to be able to say, okay, fine. Black women have been turned against us. We're going to turn the other cheek because we need to show them that we are able to rise to the occasion and not sink to our training. Because what we are seeing in black women right now is that they're sinking to their training and not rising to the occasion. They're not giving us the love that we need to say, listen, black men have been brutalized. Let us extend some love. We're not accepting the bad things that they do. We're not condoning them. But we are saying we understand what is driving that. And we accept that there's some education that needs to happen. We accept that there's some counseling that needs to happen. And it's not going to happen unless we make the choice or we take the responsibility upon ourselves because no one is doing it for us. White people are not going to come and teach black people how to love one another. We need to start loving one another. And as black men, we need to ask ourselves one important question. Must it be up to women all the time? 
I mean, like, seriously, like, every single time. Whenever we need to march and everything else, yes, we get killed by bullets. Why do we need to um, drag women into the fight and, and, and use them and appeal to the mercy of our oppressors? You know? Let us actually take up this fight on our own, on behalf of women, because we've already seen that our enemies have corrupted black women against us. And let me mention this point. Um, and I don't think the solution is Ngala Abafa's bait as a matota bantaba mnyama. Because yeah. now the enemy gets happy because I'm seeing a lot more and more of these red pill movements mm. that are anti, not women. just anti black women, they are anti women. Yeah. Uh, and I was saying it earlier, the mm. MGTOW guys, the men going their own way, mm. men just being against women and mm. just, I don't think that's the solution. It's exactly what you're saying where mm. we have to stand up and take responsibility as men and fight for that family unit. And I mm. pray for you, my brother. No, thank Even you. if things... Thank you. um so You're the first person so to say that. I pray for you. That's, 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 the, that's, the, the, worst, main... that's the worst thing to say, for me to say, is that you're the first person to say, I pray for you. I'm praying for you. I love you, bro. Thank you. I love you. you. I think you're one of the most critical voices of this current generation. Uh, I, I, I was I was once at a point in my life where I knew that if I say one thing, the country's youth will do it. Mm. I knew when I was one of those voices. Yes, mm. I, and I still am. Mm. I'm no longer at my prime though as a mm. youth or as an entertainer. Mm. But right now in 2022, mm. in the culture of 2022 and where mm. the internet and social media is right now, mm. Voices like yours, voices mm. like Abu Penuel, voices mm. like Abu Ntantalaks, mm. voices like Abu Douglas Ngubeni, mm. voices like all these amazing young women, Abu Ntiki Mazwai. Mm. There might be differences amongst all of us. We might mm. argue all of us, mm. but all you we guys debate. are relevant voices right now in 2022. And please realize that mm. and do something positive and constructive with mm. your voices because you're no longer who you were five, six, seven, ten years ago. Mm. And people that are, that are the most relevant voices now, it's no longer us. Mm. It's you guys. Mm. So you guys stand up and realize that and stop these little fights amongst yourselves on Twitter and whatever. Mm. Your voices are so powerful and in mm. influential, Nota. Mm. I'm sitting with you right yeah. now. Yeah. People are walking past. They're not saying DJ Spoo. Mm. They're saying, yeah, Nota. Mm. And it's three guys, bro. Yeah, it's so that's here. who you guys are right now. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's what you guys have become in 2022. Your voices matter. No, you are influential you. voices. So you guys must realize that you're no longer just in J.A. the youth. You are now what we were to now, say a decade ago. Mm. It's you guys right mm. now. And, and because got, me and my the children, of your we've got the knowledge of, of your mistakes. Of our mistakes, yes. My mistakes, Nabum Tu, Nabum Mandoza, Nabo Zola, Nabo Nabo Sisipiwa Tana, Nabo Sistandi. You guys have learned from us. And you guys you know have what I mean? also got the perspective of, of saying what's at stake if if we don't live up to our And a lot is at stake because in Ngosi Ze, to me, in Ngosi Ami Pegenina. All the young voices that are all over social media right now. So it matters that you guys understand that because you guys are now mm. role models of our children. You understand? And that is why I've said that even us as role models, we need to be able to hold each other accountable. If I see something wrong, I need to be able to freely speak about it. And it mustn't be seen as if, like, uh, I'm a crazy person or it must not be normalized that someone can call someone Isanya. Because I, I told you about this. I said, But that's normal. How many times have I been called No, no, Isanya? but the, the, in, what I'm talking about right now yeah. is that with what's at stake right now, with the type of voices that we need to be um, um, propelling because yeah. we've got the wrong voices yeah. having the platform right now, we cannot normalize that because it's part of those toxic behaviors. That says, okay, let's shut down this voice. By and, and Dave Chappelle says it well. You understand? Uguti, the most dismissive thing you can ever say about a person is that they're crazy. That's it. Uguti, shine. So, so just imagine the pain that I went through when it's my own wife that is tweeting or saying those things. Heal, my brother. So, Heal. So, sort it out. So, well, I mean, look, as far as the healing part, I've healed. And there's nothing wrong with me being disappointed in someone's actions when they are harming me. There's nothing wrong with me saying that hurt me. You understand what I'm saying? Because if I am not able to say that, trust me, there's so many people that are influenced, that are watching, that now won't be able to speak about, actually, I, I was hurt by that. It was painful. You know what I mean? Because that's the person out of the whole entire world. If the whole entire world is supposed to be against me, my wife is supposed to be with me. And she's the one that's taking a knife, not even in my back, right at my throat, and slicing me in half. And... That is the test that you need to go through as a black man to prove that you are a, a role model. 
you need to either be put in jail for 27 years like Nelson Mandela, or you need to have your wife slice your throat in front of the whole entire world and then show everybody, see, I'm fine. I'm okay. I'll bleed, I will heal. Because I'm not a human being. You should not ever feel for me. I can be raped, I can be beaten up, I can be brutalized. A, a cop can stand with his knee on my neck and you guys will take videos. Not one person will stop that cop. Not one person will say, I'm stopping this. This man is all going to die today. Not one man stopped George Floyd from dying. Not one woman stopped George Floyd from dying. So They could was... watch as a black man is being murdered in front of their eyes. And they recorded it as a man was being killed in front of their eyes. Because they did not see a black man as a human being. It was like they're slaughtering an animal. Guys, let's be there for one another. At the end of the day, you know, say about to song. And, and, I, and mm. I'm not going to say it, you know, you know, we took the high road. We're better than everybody else. But mm. justice will know. Even now, mm. we, we are recording some episodes. As I say that mm. you're a friend of the podcast, mm. you'll always keep coming mm. back here. We had an episode that we recorded. One of our brilliant, one of our most brilliant episodes. Mm. Not one of our most brilliant episodes is Ganota. No, mm. one of our most brilliant episodes. Mm. And then it was just archived in Jeve. Mm. What did we say, Justo, when this man was trending and was being crucified? And Mina, my Twitter has been hacked for quite some time. So I haven't been yeah. on Twitter yeah. in, in quite a while. But because of what trends on Twitter influences everything else on Facebook, yeah. on TikTok. So you see yeah. information everywhere. And I knew, and I'd, let me not say I knew what you were going through, but... I think with the amount of you um, could relate to what I was going through. that you were going yeah. through at the time, that's when me and this man, Justice, we decided, let's drop the Nota episode now. That was strategic and it was intentional. Guys, check it out. That episode is not the one with me and, and Daniel I, and Nota. It's just the one with, oh, both of us, we were wearing Mofire jumpsuits. I ne I, I, I never we dropped that episode at that time and, and that day fire. intentionally. I never got to thank you for that. You know, we never spoke about it. And we never said anything. Um, uh, to each other even after that um, that episode we only spoke about now shooting now it's the first time we've spoken ab about that like even now and that is the example that I was saying that we need to show when I said that when you were fired from Metro FM for opening that bottle on that stage we should have said we are boycotting Metro FM we're not going to allow Buddha to be uh, done like that you showed the, that exact same example and for me it was natural because I say, if anyone has been watching the content or anything, you know, everything that was happening around that time, what I had not been able to, to get out there at that point in time was that it wasn't even only a personal attack on me. It was an attack on you, which I witnessed happening within my own eyes. So... Prior to um, uh, that whole entire thing where my wife was tweeting and everything else, the stylist, um, we, we supported the stylist, you know, gave them a severance, um, you know, gave them good recommendations because the stylist was acting sort of like my wife's manager. But, I mean, like, they don't have the actual skill. You know what I mean? I was like, you know what? I can teach her how to take care of her own career. When you weren't looking, I had your back. You didn't need to to ask me when i wasn't looking you had my back i didn't have to ask you and that's the example that we need to show to black men especially because the war is on us and and, and, and we are so quick to pull each other down and and we celebrate each other's downfall we laugh at each other's faults we share videos of each other intoxicated or sends a my flop i mean now our time in van now now tune on my floor and then keep your phone in your broadcast and send your post. Why? You why? know, I'll be there for you. And instead of switching on the phone, you have to go to my floor and you have to go to my Or something exactly. like that. I'll be the last person to share content of you. You have to go to the floor and you have to go to the floor. You understand? That's I will stop world you from now. It's disappointing, Buffet. You I'll, know? I'll give you an example. This trended. You know, when I was still working with Cuesta, we had an argument uh, sometime after we were coming from a gig. Yeah, and he had, he had been drinking the whole time. Or the guys, all of them had been drinking. There was an interview that was supposed to happen um, at Metro FM early in the morning with uh, Fat Joe and Pearl Tusi. And I said, I'm not going to this interview. I'm saying, I'm willing to call these people and cancel it and be the bad guy. I promise you, if you go to this interview, you'll regret it. By the time I woke up 
already a video of him trending and everything else was there. They took videos of him. Now, Fat Joe is just doing content. Pearl Tusi as well, they're just doing content. But they saw that this person is not in a state to be interviewed, right? But for them, they're just making content and not part of his team. And that moment almost destroyed so many other work opportunities. I had to call clients and say, listen, yes, obviously we had a rough night, but we promised to do this interview, so we did it. You know what I mean? We, on our word, yes, okay, we won't do another one. Next time we'll cancel it, we've learned our lesson. But that point in time, I needed to now also understand that when someone is at a level of fame where everybody around them can tell them what they want to hear, even if it's against them, there's almost nothing you can do about it. There's almost nothing you can do about it. I can provide, make sure that every bill is paid, make sure that if my wife needs a music video, it's paid for. If she needs a trip to a recording studio, it's paid for. But if the environment around her is able to convince her that, no, your husband, he's too controversial, or he's getting too famous, or he's shining on your shine, or whenever you're walking with him, people greet him and not you, so he's overtaking you, he's overshadowing you. If that can get to her and she can't love me enough to objectively look and say, my husband is much more accomplished than I am. I, I understand I'm a singer and everything else, but the things that he has achieved in his career, I'm, I learn from him. I trust him to help me with my career. Where I'm going in my career now, everything that you've seen is because he's been by my side to assist me. The last thing I would do is take a knife and stab this, the same man who's helped me get to this level in the throat just because the rest of you are challenged or uh, 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 are threatened by him and his light. And I now need to understand that I can't expect my wife to rise to the occasion just because I would. I need to be able to forgive her and say she wasn't able to rise to the occasion in, in, in that extent. But me, as a man, and understanding what's at stake, I need to be able to rise to the occasion in, that, in those same circumstances with a knife at my throat, with myself bleeding out of my neck. I need to be able to rise to the occasion and show love and show love to especially my brothers and say, we are going to help each other get through the storm right now and rebuild our family values as black men so that when we get to the finish line and women need to know why they respect us, as black men, why they should respect us, we'll be able to say we rebuilt the black family. And that is, for that sole reason, we deserve your respect. And if they respect us, then we can say we are able to give you unconditional love because we've come to a point where now we have gotten what we desire out of women, which is respect. And we are able to now love ourselves enough because we are respected by those that we desire or those that we admire. We respect it. That's the one thing. Everything that we do as men is to be respected by women. You buy you, cars. You do know also that a, a man interprets respect from a woman as love, right? Mm, that is, yes, exactly. It's not about affection and love. It's about respect. When a man is respected by his woman. That's loved. He feels loved. That is it. That's that is that, that is it. And, and when we are respected, we're able to give love. And if you also look at a lot of situations where we find that men end up abusing women. A lot of the situations come from the man feeling disrespected. Mm -mm, I will not be a, an apologist for a woman abuser. We're not apologists. Yeah, we're I, not, I understand, we're, we're but, not but in that statement, I will not. No, we're not. And, and, yeah, no, no, we're not apologists. Sure. sure. We're not apologists. And I don't want it to seem like I'm saying, no, this is the reason why men abuse women. No, I'm not giving a reason for why oh, okay, men abuse okay, women. Okay, sure. I, I want to state that. There's abuse that happens in relationships. Mainly with men, it, it turns physical. With women, it happens as well. Men are emotionally abused. Men are emasculated. Men are disrespected. You know, men can be shouted at. A video can trend on, on TikTok of a woman just shouting at a man, saying everything to reduce him. And no one will condemn it. No one will say this is not how a man should be treated just because it's a black man. A black man can be treated like that. And that's the abuse that we get from our sisters as well. And for me, I did that whole entire five-hour uh, long um, podcast 
with Rhea and Blackstaff. Oh, with Rhea and Blackstaff. I didn't watch all of it. I watched, yeah, I think, the no, first hour or something. If, if, if the people that got to the end, I spoke about how, as a child, my own aunt sexually abused me. And after I spoke about that, the next person who was interviewed on that same show, Zinger, then said, oh, yeah, well, he was also sexually abused. And then when I watched um, a Black Diamond, when they got interviewed on a podcast and chill, oh, yes, they were also sexually abused. Oh, that's how they lost their virginity. And then you look at all the stories of black men and how they lose their virginities and you think to yourself, actually, we've got a, a serious rape crisis. Black male children are being raped in this country. It's a pandemic. It's worse than anything you could have ever imagined because... All of them speak about it, but nobody's doing anything about it. Nobody has done anything about it from either when it began. So the way in which we've dehumanized the black man now is that we've even dehumanized the black child. As in, you don't even have that innocence of that stage where you are still young enough to be taken to your, your, your mother's um, work, Magasemins and Makishin, you know, when you are still cute before you became a, a swab khafar. We don't even have that innocence. We've lost that innocence because now our bodies can be done unto whatever people please because we're not human. So the child rape that happens to black boys goes unaddressed. The exposure to sexual content that happens to kids also corrupts their minds. Now you think to yourself, okay, my child has not been raped. There's a boy that goes to your daughter's crush that has been raped, that has been exposed to pornography. And now when you've shielded your daughter from all the exposure to rape, to pornography and everything else, and now this person then touches your child inappropriately because this behavior has been normalized. And even as perfect as your household is, now your own daughter becomes a victim because we're not addressing this issue. Because black boys uh, are not seen. They're like seen like stray dogs. You know what I mean? Even if it, 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 it's on the side of the road and a car is driven over it, you just overtake it and say, hey, man, these stray dogs, they need to keep them on a leash, man. That's what a black boy is, a black child. If a black boy it goes into Mkoti and is lost and whatever, the community immediately looks for him. And then once they found him, yes, we do a whole entire ceremony. And then we move on. It's another death of a black person. There is no, oh, these are the young black boys that we've lost over the years to manhole covers and everything else. So they've dehumanized us to that point. They've dehumanized black women as well. But trust me, every single year when it's Women's Day, they remember all of the women that have been lost to femicide, gender-based violence, rape. All of the women affected that have um, come into media pro uh, prominence are remembered. We remember Garabo to this day. I can't tell you who's the last black boy that, was, uh, that died a week ago or a couple of days ago. It's gotten to the point where even the way in which we've been dehumanized as black men, the Zamazamas raped only the black women because they know that there's nothing black men will do. They left, there were white girls there. They didn't touch them. Because they know white men will do something about this. White men have not been dehumanized to the point where white girls can get abused and there's no retaliation. So they allow those white girls to watch as black girls are being raped repeatedly. By dehumanized black men who see themselves as less than human. And so... They don't need to hold themselves up to the behavioral standards of not violating other human beings. Because they're not human themselves. They're not seen as human. You understand? There's no place that recognizes them as human. If you go to Rosebank, you'll find Tasha's full. There'll be black girls. They'll be sitting there. Some of them have got money and everything else. Sitting at a table with drinks. A black man who's a cleaner, will come and sweep. He will sweep and they won't move their feet because they can't see him. Abambo, like, they, like, like Abamboni. He'll have to say, and then they'll move their feet because they can't see him. That's how much the black man has been dehumanized. Now, 
the only thing that's stopping us as black men from dehumanizing ourselves as well as one another is because when you see another black man, you see another black man. You know? So even the guy who's trying to sweep, you move yourself when if you're sitting at a restaurant as a black man. And that's the only person who will ever show any kindness or any courtesy to a black man who does not have money or fame. <laughs> I want you back. We can't finish everything. <laughs> we can't, we, no, we can't finish it's September everything. now, October. I'll see you again soon. Next yeah. month again. We have to do this regularly. I'm yeah. glad you, you, you're feeling better. I'm glad intellectually you, 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 you're still high up there. Uh, I think there's more from you that um, no, one is you, looking forward to, to, see, to see you um, thank you to the contribute squatters. to the world. You know what I mean? And the hustlers. I know they were, they were worried because they're like, yo, we're worried about our guy. But yo, all those episodes that you guys have seen have been recorded after I've already gone through all of this, after I've already um, uh, gone through the therapy process and everything else. Yeah, no, but also I'm glad, I'm glad you came out and owned your truth. Yeah. Because sometimes there can be truth about you out there, but the narrative is wrong. Mm. So sometimes it's important to stand up exactly as you're saying about mm. me. I mean, I've decided to let a lot of stuff slide, mm. but I don't think it's a good thing, especially in our days. Mm. You have to stand up and own your narrative. Mm. Kanye West talks about it all the time. Mm. Own your own narrative. Own your own, own narrative. Your narrative. You know, because yeah. if, 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 if you allow the narrative to be created for you, it, your reputation precedes you. It yeah. walks into the room before, before you, know, you do. And for me, it's like, Every single business meeting I need to walk into now, because of things that now my wife has said, I now need to explain myself further. You know, the amount of work I've done to be treated like a human being. I had to work to be treated like a human being. I'm a black man, so I haven't been treated like a human being for the longest part of my life. It's only now that I've got a Mercedes Benz, that uh, I've got some accomplishments, that people know who I am, that I get treated like a human being. Prior to this, I used to get beaten up just like any other black man in the streets, you know? And it took me a lot many, many years to create a reputation of a sensible human being out there so that I'm not seen as a black savage like we are seen as black savages. I'm going to reiterate this and remind you what you said the previous mm. interview. Nota, you said, now I want to be presidential. Remember mm. those words exactly. and, and walk as such. You, you see? That's Love the thing. You, so, so, so with the destruction that has happened to my name, right now, the only way that I can prove people wrong, right? Is even through this fire to remain presidential. Thank you. And it's just by being great. And being tested. And show love back. Man. And that's it. No, that's what I do. And that's I it. ignore and this nonsense. I, I show love back. And I let my work speak for itself while I show love to everybody, you know? Yeah, that's it. That's mm. it. And, you know, the work is speaking for itself. People are resonating, you know. Uh, and I'm, I'm thankful for all the love that I get. You're brilliant. When I'm in the streets. You're so a bright you, thank mind. You, thank you. Thank you. You're thank amazing. You. Thank you. And thank I know you. you know that, but I want you. you to know that all the time when you come to our platform and our squatters and hustlers mm. will always tell you, you'll see the comments yeah you know what no I mean? thank you and, and, thank and you. you must recognize that side of you and vibrate more on that side as yeah. opposed to you um doing not pres not so presidential things yeah thank you no. <laughs> i love no, you bro good to see thank you again you. thank you so much i'll see Shop, you soon Shop. again guys you'll see him soon again don't complain ah mr nota was just there he's back again this is his home man there's, <laughs> there's people that you'll see here very often you're gonna see Penuel, very often here, you will see Nicoletta Machila, very often here, you will see Nota here. You will see there's just a certain number of people you'll yeah. always see here. And we need more and more and more and more people. And soon we'll be seeing you guys. Yeah, like, we'll be seeing. And then you guys are starting your podcast. I'm so proud of you. Yeah. Keep going, guys. It's difficult in the beginning, but this thing just needs consistency over at least three years. Yeah. I'm and just then you'll start seeing, you start seeing the difference. I'm disappointed in, in, in the high school kids. We don't know what's going on in the high schools because there's no high school kids that are making their own podcasts. So I think we need to start buying them equipment, you know? Or sponsoring Or come them. up with some ways, yeah. Let's okay. go to the... Let's buy one school, maybe a podcast situation so that they've got their own shooting, whatever, in that whole school. Let's, and then we take the Let's start, it, we start, let's start guys, it at a school in Tembisa. That's a good one. Let's do it. Cool. I'll see you guys on the next video. Chop, chop. Follow notes on all his platforms. What's with the bottle? Shoot the other day about Ingolosia. Boom, boom, one. But that's something I've never seen before. Okay, right, starts working. Yeah, but it's following the signs. Yo, yo, yo. Maga Figara, since part of the man, they've been waiting for him. Korkotlom Lulan or Vulalit. Bad boy, Lingilos, not the Shangilos, Kulumis, Zulia, Zatin. 
It was never about the wings, Mfanwa. It, it's the fire in you. Yeah?